today we're going to be reading from Hosea chapter 6 and chapter 7 and this is because those two books are separated by somebody who came along in the future, not our future, in our past, but in the future from when it was written and they defined the scriptures by chapters and of course originally when the scriptures were written there was no chapters. Okay, So we find that this uh, one teaching is separated into two separate chapters. Okay, so in my previous message we looked at God's judgment. So chapter 5 of the book of Hosea was about God's judgment against his people in the northern kingdom of Israel and his judgment was for sinful idolatry and their folly in trusting in their own deliverance. So they thought that they could actually sort it out for themselves. The problem in all of this is that when people seek their own deliverance, and we can think about this very clearly today, when we seek to solve our own problems, sometimes you don't realise, but you actually need to go to God. Because the reason the problems are there is because you've actually turned away from God. And so when a sinful northern kingdom of Israel abandoned God to worship idols and to have their own priests and to have their own practices, it was actually God who was punishing them. And yet instead of turning to him to stop the punishment, they turned to other nations and other gods to, to uh, handle the situation in their own way. And this is clearly not the way. So this is something for us today as well. There are things that happen in the spirit realm around us. And there are things that are happening in this world which we seek to lay blame on mankind and we seek for a, an, an answer. And then we seek for a resolution and we all do our best to resolve those issues. But what if it isn't something from us? What if it, what if it is only one pathway back? And that is turning back to God. So we live in a world today which is increasingly atheistic. We live in a world today which in, in, in turn is also producing its own idols at a rapid rate of knots. And we live in a world today of competing religions. Many of them, of course, are going to actually take you away from God. And so what we really need to do is we really need to turn back to God. And this is what Hosea is doing. The analogy of Hosea, you may recall when we first started studying this word, is that Hosea was called to marry a prostitute. Not one who had been a prostitute in the past, but a person who was an active prostitute in his present. He married her, he had three children with her, whom God named, and then she continued to do what she did. But why did God do this? Because God wanted him to understand what it was like for himself. So the analogy of a prostitute is what? Would anyone like to remember what the analogy is being used of a prostitute in the Bible or an adulterer? Because this comes up in the scriptures all the time with Hosea. Who, who was a prostitute and who was an adulterer and why is it called that? Any ideas? I've oh, got you on the hop. So, when someone's an adulterer, that means that they're doing what? They're married to one person, and yet they're sleeping with another. And so God uses this analogy and makes Hosea marry a prostitute because he wants to understand what it's like when he's the father of the people of Israel, and yet they go to bed with other gods. Other gods. And so this is his message. So they're adulterers. And the other gods are prostitutes. They're replacing him. Now we're meant to be the bride, right? The church. Which means that if we're replacing God, our husband, with a false idol, that makes us a prostitute. It makes us an adulterer. Okay? So that's that terminology that comes in. So in today's message, we're going to look at both chapters 6 and 7, in which the inflamed and unrepentant idol-worshipping Israelite are called by God, through his prophet Hosea, to return to the Lord, 
But let's open our Bibles to today's first reading. So we're going to go to Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. I'll put the reference behind me here. So Hosea chapter 6, verses 1 to 2. And we're going to commence to hear how Israel's people should trust in God who chastens them and to hear also a muted prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus on the third day. So this is quite extraordinary. So let's read. So chapter 6, verse 1 to 2. It says, Come, let us return to the Lord. So this is Hosea speaking a prayer to the Israelites. He has torn us, and take notice of this, He has torn us, God has torn us, to pieces, but He will heal us. God has that power. He has injured us, but he will bind up our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. And then it says, on the third day, he will restore us, that we may live in his presence. So this is Hosea speaking, as I said, because he says, come, let us return to the Lord. He is communicating with the people of Israel. So if we go back our previous chapter to Hosea 5 verse 1 it actually defines for us who he's actually speaking to and this, and he's actually addressing the three estates of the realm so he's addressing the people he's addressing the priests and he's also addressing the house of his king and we can know this because Hosea 5 verse 1 says hear this you priests so there's the priesthood Pay attention, you Israelites, they're the people. Listen, O royal house, so the king and his family and his court. This judgment is against you. So we're in the next chapter. So he's continuing on to speak to these same people. So when we mention the word Israelites, we're talking about the whole body of all levels of society. Now, Hosea prays with the right heart here. And instead of arguing with God or resenting his correction, Hosea leads Israel in humble prayer. So when a rebellious child, and this is what we need to think of, when a rebellious child has been corrected, disciplined or chastened for their behaviour and lack of submission, they will probably complain what? That their parents do not love them. Right? Because they don't like what they're receiving. And they often will not receive or respond to that love. Why? Because it's in the form of discipline. So is this true? It is, isn't it? No one likes to be disciplined and told they're doing the wrong thing. Okay. And so it is with the Israelites and God. Hosea trusts the love of God and his loving hand of correction, but the Israelites do not. So here's a people, they've drifted away from the Lord, they've made their own idols, they've set up their own priesthood, They've been doing what they're doing for quite some time now. And Hosea comes along and says, you know, you've got to submit yourself back to the Lord again. And so they're like recalcitrant children. And they're like, there is no way. He doesn't love us. We wouldn't be having the problems we have unless he did. And so instead of going back to him and realising that their problems are because of walking away from the Lord, they refuse to and they seek their own methods. So Hosea, however, is confident in God's love and power to restore. He speaks of God's punishment when he says, He has torn us to pieces. These are the words in the first verse. And he has injured us. So very strong and direct words. He has torn us to pieces and he has injured us. But he speaks of and shows his trust in a loving God when he also says at the same time, But he will heal us and he will bind up our wounds okay so in the same way that god can judge us and punish us he can also heal us and restore us back into relationship the notable thing that jose does here is he puts a time frame on it that prophesies the resurrection of jesus on the third day when he says in verse 2 on the third day he will restore us that we may live in his presence very specific isn't it on the third day so we know that jesus was crucified 
and he rose again on the third day and by so doing he restores us back into relationship with the father so we can come into his presence so you may recognize the analogy of the action of being torn to pieces and injured in the scripture before it when jesus is crucified because this is what happened to him the promise that you will be healed by his wounds and the outcome in which you will be restored to live in god's presence when jesus is raised up on the third day so let's now go to verse 3. So Hosea chapter 6, verse 3. Hosea 6, verse 3. And it reads, Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us press on to acknowledge him. As surely as the sun rises, he will appear. We were just praying and worshipping the Lord. And what do we talk about? We give thanks for the fact that we wake up in the morning because as sure as the sun rises the lord will appear and it goes on to say he will come to us like the winter rains like the spring rains that water the earth so there's two sets of rains that are incorporated in the scripture so my first question here today is that the term acknowledge actually means to have knowledge of so when you say acknowledge that means that you have knowledge of because when we acknowledge something we agree to it don't we we can only agree to it if we have knowledge of it otherwise you're a fool right so the term acknowledge means to have knowledge of so jose says here in essence let us have knowledge of the lord and let us press on to have knowledge of the lord so there are those two components of acknowledgement so my question is what exactly is wrong with the people of israel so we've had a bit of a break uh, from our last teaching so your, your memory may be a little bit shy here but this there is a problem so as we're talking about uh, a consequence or an action as a result of something that's happened in the past god doesn't punish people for no reason right so there's something that's happened he doesn't judge people so what exactly is wrong with the people of israel what have they done Yes, it, and that's all tied into it. And they're not accepting God in the good and the bad times. Right. So we've got this abandonment of God in general that we're getting through the scripture. But in the scriptures, there's actually, as usual, God gives us the answers in his own scriptures. Okay. So it's not in today's reading, but it's actually in last uh, lessons reading. And so, um, sorry, uh, two lessons ago or two sermons ago so if you go to Hosea chapter 4 verse 6 it actually describes specifically what Israel's problem is so Hosea 4 verse 6 has anyone found that would you like to what does it say my people are doomed because they do not acknowledge me you priests have refused to acknowledge me and have rejected my teaching and so I reject you Right. So we have those words acknowledge come up again, right? So basically, and those words said doomed, another version may say destroyed, but basically it's saying God is saying my people are destroyed from lack of knowledge. So this is a very specific word. What what is knowledge? knowing learning. learning listening listening so it's actually an action Trust of teach. right mm. so there's things that actually happen and that you have to do or have to receive in order to have knowledge right mm. it has to come from somewhere it's not an inanimate object it's not like you're going picking up a rock off the road for example mm. right knowledge is something that you acquire by investing yourself mm. right and often by others investing in you so with what we're reading now we're reading the bible and so god provides his word to you so he provides his knowledge to you so that you too can have knowledge and wisdom and know how is the right way to live by god 
And so it says here that his people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. So why have they been destroyed from a lack of knowledge? What could what could temptation. cause that? Temptation listening of to, distraction. Listening to religious leaders. Listening to religious leaders, and this is an Greed. issue which comes up in that scripture which we'll go back to. Greedy people. Greedy people. Self, yeah. Self. Mm. So again, as as Teresa's already read, that same scripture from chapter four, verse six in Hosea, in the balance of the scripture it actually gives you the answer. And it reveals that God is talking to whom? He's talking to priests at this point in time. And it reads, because you have rejected knowledge, I also reject you as my priests. Because you have ignored the law of God, I will also ignore your children. Mm. So in other words, there's a responsibility of the teachers, the priests in this case, to give the true word of God to his people, because that will teach them how to live well, whom God is, and so on and so on. But it's clear here that the priests are not walking with God, so as a consequence, their message isn't about walking with God, and so the people no longer have an understanding of whom God is. So if you're in a situation and you have a leader who you acknowledge and accept, and people who say things to you that influence you, and we're talking about something earlier today, then basically it's incumbent upon the person who's teaching or sharing with you to, at a minimum, be truthful. Mm. Right? In this case, we're talking about the Word of God. So if the priest do not share the Word of God to his people, then how is his people going to know whom he is? Mm. Right? And so very easily falls apart, and we have examples of this in the Bible, where there is misleading teaching that's going on, and of course it takes the people away from the Lord. And so there's an accountability for those who teach, which is greater for those who receive. But if you're someone who's receiving, what should you be doing? Walking with God. Walking with God. Doing what he says. Doing what he says, but we're talking about in terms of knowledge, what should you be doing? Reading your Bible. Doing your right. So you should read your Bible. So when I stand here before you and I put up this scripture reference for you, this means that this comes from God's Word and we're teaching God's Word. Mm. Not my version of it, not my interpretation of it, but God's Word. So you can open your Bible, find this for yourself, and you can receive for, uh, read it for yourself and determine... Am I actually teaching you what comes from the Bible? Sure. So this is what you should be doing. Mm -hmm. right? There's no expectation that anyone should stand before you and you should receive what they say without any form of checking it or, as they call it in the Bible, meditation or study. Right? So you need to dwell in the Word. The Lord will speak to you directly as well. So, obviously, this reveals a serious issue and a serious responsibility. Because the, fail, the priests fail in their responsibility to teach the laws of God as they are given in the Word of God, they not only condemn themselves, but they also condemn all of God's people to sin and the consequences of sin. So, what does that translate to today? A teacher or a pastor in a church is responsible for his flock. And he's responsible to teach them the word of God as it's given. If he doesn't, then he will lead them away from the Lord. It may look like a church, it may smell like a church, but if the word is not there, it's not true and it's not correct, we can still lead people away from the Lord. Okay? And so you always have the ability to, to discern by reading the word yourselves. So in context of today's scripture, Hosea is leading his people to repent and correct this problem. So this is what he's doing right now. They've acknowledged the problem. They said the problem is they don't have the knowledge. The priests haven't been teaching the word of God. And so he is now humbly praying to the Lord to get his people to repent and to correct this problem. So for those of us who live today, 
as I said, what should each of us be doing? We've already spoken about this, that we should be reading the word. So you should pursue, and this is the word, you should pursue the knowledge of the Lord, and when you do, he will bless you, the scriptures that speak about this. This must be more than something superficial, however. It must be that word. It must be a pursuit. What do you do when you pursue something? You chase. It's a high energy activity, right? It's not something that you do lapsadaisical. It's something that you put every effort into. And so the Lord tells us that with eagerness, that we should, we, we spoke about this scripture the other night, that with eagerness, Paul says this, the Apostle Paul, that you should receive the word of God with eagerness and then you should spend time to read it for yourself and, and have discernment over the word. Okay? In other words, you should check what you're receiving all the time. So, when you do this, the Bible tells us that the Lord will reveal himself to you. So if I was to tell you that by pursuing his word and gaining knowledge of him, this is a way that he will reveal himself to you, then it's something that you should surely want to do. Right? So in Hebrews 11.6, God says, that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Okay? And so in that uh, scripture, we've got the word seek, so that's akin to this pursuing. But the word earnestly is like saying you have to be sincere. Right? You're not going to read the Bible like a, a normal book. You're going to seek the Lord. And you're not going to just know about him in a superficial way like you are reading a normal story. Okay, Okay. so verse 3 here that we're looking at says, Surely as the sun rises, the Lord will appear and then make a reference, and then it makes a reference to two seasonal rains. So in these ancient days, anyone know about what the two seasonal rains are before I, I explain them? There's two lots of rains. Summer and winter. Close. Winter and spring. Winter and spring. Well, that's actually, it's going into winter, so it's autumn. But yes, you're, you're, you're on this. So, in the ancient days, the only way to water crops, so we're talking about the land of Israel here, was by rain. So they had wells everywhere so people could get water for their livestock and for themselves, but they couldn't actually water a crop, so to speak. Mm. Okay? So they were reliant upon the rains. And there's what's known as the former rain and the latter rain. Mm. Okay? So a former rain is when a farmer waits with great anticipation and this fall fell in autumn. So it was a time um, to prepare the earth for the seed to go in. Okay. Hosea says to the Israelites and to us today that we should, in the same way, we should wait with anticipation for God, for he will come and he will answer us. Now the latter rain fell in spring, and this was to prepare what is termed the full ear for the time of the corn of the harvest. Why do you think they call it the full ear? Does anyone know what that expression means? Like corn? Like corn. A, cor a cob of corn is actually known as a yes. ear of yeah. corn. Mm -hmm. Why is it called an ear, do you think? Because it's, it's a funny thing, isn't it? It's rare, it's full. <laughs> Without your ears, you can't. It, it, has a, it, has a, uh, it has a sheath on there, okay, with these layers that you peel back to reveal what is a if you, have you seen wheat yeah. or other grain crops yeah. do they also have a sheath they on them cover, yeah. that actually covers the seed as well That's right. so these are all these crops and are called an ear of grain or an ear of corn right so this ear is this description for those items so it says a full ear which means that the actual sheath itself has 
filled up with what's growing inside of it, okay? So, uh, for the time of harvest. And so it is that these two rain events, which is what? What do we look at rain as? Water. <laughs> Something more than water. Oh, it's a blessing from God. It's a blessing from God. It's God's yeah. provision. You see, you can't grow your crops unless there's water. Mm. And who provides the water? God provides the water and the crops will grow. Now they're also provided, it's not just what's provided, it's when it's provided. Yeah. It's provided at a time when you need to plant so there's enough moisture in the ground for it to grow. And then it's provided again at a time before the harvest so that it can be fulfilled or, or the, the, the fruit <laughs> itself can actually come to completion before it's actually harvested. And it's timed at the times of year in conjunction with the temperature and everything else. So it's quite incredible, isn't it? Mm. So it's about God's provision. And of course, the rising sun will come just as the Lord will come to us. And we know that crops need sun as well in order to grow. <coughs> so this is a message that should give you confidence because if you pursue knowledge of the Lord, it's saying that he will come to you. So this is what you need to draw out of the scripture. You have to do the pursuing and he will do the coming. Okay, but if you don't pursue the Lord right. and you show no interest, then don't expect him to come. Okay, right. and so this is the simple matter. So it's like an instruction that tells us what we should be doing. Okay, so let's go now to Hosea 6 verses 4 to 6. So the next portion of the scripture, Hosea 6 verses 4 to 6. And this pertains to the sin of Israel and in this case also Judah, and how God's people have missed his heart. And so this is something that we find comes up continuously throughout the Old Testament. And it's about missing God's heart. So it reads, What can I do with you, Ephraim? What can I do with you, Judah? Your love is like the morning mist, like the early dew that disappears. Therefore I cut you in pieces with my prophets. I killed you with the words of my mouth. My judgments flashed like lightning upon you. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. And so God's being quite clear here. Now, Ephraim, what is Ephraim? Who does that represent? Israel. Right, so it, re it represents the northern kingdom of Israel, and obviously Judah represents the southern kingdom of judah okay so we know the united kingdom was divided after king solomon and so both of them are now two separate entities but both of course are the israelite people so he uses the word ephraim we've spoken about this before does anyone remember why he 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 concentrates on the word ephraim for the northern kingdom of israel especially here because he's talking about the sin of the priests because he addresses the priests, he addresses the people too. But what's significant about Ephraim? Um, isn't that where the, um, the calves, the golden calves, right. put on the shrine? Right. So Bethel is the border city, if you will, between the north and south. And they built a golden calf there. They also formed the priesthood there. And we also find that this is where the original king's tribe came from, Jeroboam. Remember, he used to go down to work at the Temple of Jerusalem when he was spoken to during the time of King Solomon. And they also built another golden calf and placed it at the, in the tribe of Dan on the northern boundary. And, um, but everything, the activity of all of this happened in Ephraim itself. Okay? So this is often mentioned for that reason. So God, he says that their faith is like a morning cloud or early dew. So it's not that there is no faith at all. What happens to a morning dew or a morning cloud? They dissipate and they go, right? So in other words, there's something there, but it doesn't last. Okay, so he's saying that that means that amongst the people of Israel, there's still an acknowledgement of God and his existence, but it's fleeting. In other words, they're not walking with him. So God expresses the means by which he has communicated with them, judged them and punished them, but all seems to be no avail. Mm. 
Now, in Hosea chapter 5, again, in verse 6, it says, When the people go with their flocks and herds to seek the Lord, they do not find him. This means that the people are doing what? He says, when they go to the Lord with their flocks and herds. What do you think that means? Look at this scripture. Look at this scripture. Because it says something in the last line. It says this word sacrifice and burned offerings. He doesn't want that. He doesn't need sacrifices like the burnt offerings like in the Old Testament. He wants them to have a relationship. Right. So you've jumped the gun and and (laughs) taught everyone exactly what we need to know. So that's fantastic. No, no, it's fantastic because you understand. That's the whole point. Right? Acknowledgement. The thing is, in five, in, in Hosea 5 verse 6, it says the people go with the flocks and herd to seek the Lord. That means that they're taking their animals for their sacrifice, okay? To seek the Lord. What do they do? Why do they take an animal for a burnt offering in order to seek the Lord? Because what are they seeking? Redemption. Redemption. So it's the atonement that they do once a year when they go to the temple, okay? So this word that they say there is them talking about taking their animals to the temple. So this means, as I said, the people were still, because we're in the book of Hosea, this tells us that the people were still bringing a sacrifice to God as a burnt offering. Right. So that means that they were practicing their religion. But God says he doesn't want their sacrifice because they have forsaken mercy with them. That's the key here. They have forsaken mercy with their evil actions because they gave up the knowledge of God, as I mentioned earlier. And as we roll through the scripture, you'll see the evil actions that they actually do and why they've given up their mercy. So God makes it clear, as Teresa just said, that he would rather have the right hearts full of truth and mercy than a sacrifice. Jesus quoted this passage twice to the religious leaders that he spoke with because they too missed the heart of God and focused on the wrong things and the superficial things. So we're talking about the fact that the process of taking an animal to be sacrificed right, was something that God asked people to do, but they had to do it with the right heart. So if they just went through the motions of doing something, but their heart's not in it, he says he doesn't want it because it's meaningless just killing an animal now, right? It's no longer a sacrifice, it's just a process. So uh, if we go over these uh, scriptures here behind me, if we go to Matthew chapter 9, verse 13, Jesus says to them, But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. See the same words. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Okay, so that's one of those references. And another one from Matthew 12, verse 7. He says, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself, right? If you had known what these words mean, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the innocent. And so Jesus uses these words which talk about I desire mercy, not sacrifice. You see, mercy is something that comes from you. Sacrificing an animal doesn't have any real effect on you, does it? It's the animal that gets to die. So those, and this is the point here, those who see themselves as righteous are seen to attend the temple and make their sacrifices But Jesus talks about mercy because God wants the sinner to repent and come to him to be restored back into a relationship. And that's what it's about. Atonement is about repentance. So Israel brought animals for sacrifice, but they never brought themselves as a living sacrifice. They missed what God really wants. And so we have another scripture from the Apostle Paul in Romans 12, verses 1 to 2. And he says, Therefore I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not 
conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, which is another word for what we're talking about today. What the Israels what the Israelites forsake? Knowledge. So he says, transformed by the renewing of your mind, which means the gaining of knowledge. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. You will be able to test and approve what God's will is. How do you do that? By reading his word. You gain knowledge, which means that you can then use what he's given you and put it to the test. Okay? So God wants you... And so what's the test? If someone wrongs you, what do you do? Get revenge? No. What do you do? Says you have mercy. mercy. Okay. But you can only know this by reading the Word of God because your natural tendency, if someone does something to you, is you get them back. So without the knowledge of God, you can't have mercy. Okay. So God and Jesus said exactly the same thing when He's here in the flesh. He said, I don't want your sacrifice, I don't want the superficial things that everybody else sees. I want your heart, which is where your mercy comes from, and your merciful heart comes from knowledge of me. Okay? So all of these are connected together. So out of all of this, what does God really want from people? What does he want from you? Our love and us. Our love and us, which we would normally put into a package as one word and call. Relationship. Um, what God wants is a deep and a close relationship with you. But without knowledge, you can't know who God is. And without knowledge, you can't do what He wants you to do. You can't act how He wants you to act. You can't feel how He wants you to feel. You can't walk in a righteous way. Okay? So if there is anyone that hears this message that is focused on the process of doing religion. So one of the things that people sometimes do is they qualify themselves, don't they? They say, oh yeah, you know, I go to church and I pay my tithes and sacrifice. Outward symbols of declaring this is what I'm doing. But God says, I don't want that. Because... They may not actually have a personal relationship with God, but they can still pay the church and they can still pay the times, right? And they call it a, they mix love with, they call it a love offering. Right. So people think, some people may think if they give something, right. they get something back. Right. Mm. Don't and have so, to do that. right. And so when you tithe or you give an offering, you do it to sow in and to help another. You don't do it in the belief that. I'll get something back tenfold if I do this, right? So in other words, if your heart is only to do it to get something back, then you shouldn't do it. But if your heart is to help those who serve you, then you do it. That's what God calls. Why? Because that's relationship, right? You're helping those who are serving you. Relationship goes together. So you may attend church or church groups, you may tithe, you may even do community service, but what God really wants from you is your heart that comes in the form of a personal relationship. So these things are good works. God calls us to do good works, right? But the first and foremost thing is he wants relationship with you because it's born out of that relationship that you'll do the good works for the right reason. So you must call on his name, which means prayer. You must worship him and you must know him and what he wants for you by reading your Bible. Mm. Everything comes back to the word. Okay, so let's now move on to uh, the rest of this chapter. Hosea chapter 6 verses 7 to what I've said 11a, the first verse of, chapter of, of verse 11. And it's about the transgression of idolatry or the sin of Idolatry. So Hosea 6, verses 7 to 11a. And the reason I've stopped at 11a is because the chapter, the chapter boundary picks up a certain point, but it doesn't match the word of the scripture quite. So 
this is where we'll start and finish this reading. So it says, As at Adam they have broken the covenant, they were unfaithful to me there. Gilead is a city of evildoers stained with footprints of blood. As marauders lie in ambush for a victim, so do bands of priests. They murder on the road to Shechem, carrying out their wicked schemes. I have seen a horrible thing in Israel. There Ephraim is given to prostitution. Remember we spoke about this earlier. Israel is defiled. Also for you, Judah, a harvest is appointed. So God's covenant was broken when? First verse, third word, we're not playing charades, Adam, Adam, Adam. In the beginning. Right. so God's covenant, God made a covenant with Adam and it was broken before the next generation even occurred. Right. So he says here, as at Adam, they have broken the covenant. So God's covenant was broken with the first man that he created, and that's Adam. The city of evildoers, stained with the footprints of blood, is Gilead. And Gilead is the region on the eastern side of the Jordan River, in today's Jordan. Okay, so that was part, that's part of the territory of the promised land. Now bands of priests, it says, lie in ambush and murder on the road to Shechem. So Shechem is in the northern kingdom of Israel. And Ephraim is given to idol work. It's not looking good, is it? So this is where we mentioned earlier the golden calf statue is placed at Bethel on the boundary between the northern and southern kingdom and where the priesthood is created to serve this idol and others. Now this all paints a vivid picture of what? Idol worship, bloodshed and wickedness in which priests went to pagan places of sacrifice. This is why they're on the road. Essentially, it's a theft and a murder of God's people. So in other words, if I was a priest and I was leading you astray, I'm stealing God's people away from him and I'm murdering them. Why? Because when you die, you're going to go to hell. So that would make me a thief and a murderer. Strong terms, but it's exactly what would happen. So these priests are seen as thieves and murderers because they're not actually leading God's people to him, they're leading God's people away from him, and thus condemning them to hell. Now verse 11 is a reference to Judah, and a comparison to Israel, because the people of Judah will be taken into Babylonian exile, this hasn't happened yet at this stage of the Bible, and they will return, whilst the people of Israel will not. So Judah will be harvested, and in the same understanding, they will grow back and recover like a crop in a field. So Judah will be harvested, they will be taken away, and they're told to, we've spoken about this before, Jeremiah's prosperity message, mm -hmm. he tells them to go there, to live, farm their crops, have children, and the next generation will come back. So in other words, there's a harvest, and it'll return back to the land to populate the land again. And so this is a precursor word to what's happening Judah. But the main focus, of course, is on Israel, who will not come back. So God's word to the people of Israel through his prophet Hosea concerning their unrepentant ways is written, as I mentioned earlier, across two chapters. So it's both 6 and 7. So we're just coming to the end of 6. So we're now going to move to chapter 7 because the Lord's message is spread across two chapters and we will actually commence the next portion of scripture from verse 11 in, in chapter 6, the second part of it. So I did mention this, but I want you to understand that the original scriptures, the original scrolls, did not have chapters placed in them. And so I'm ceasing and starting at a different point. So chapter 7 is divided up into what we call the oven, the bread, and the dove. Okay, sounds like a meal, right? <laughs> But it's not what well, it is of sorts. But before we look at what they mean, our first portion of scripture uh, is going to come from chapter 6, verse 11, part B, as I'm calling it. Right, the second half of the scripture. Um, and we're going to read through to chapter 7, verse 2. And it describes God's willingness to take his people back 
But in order for him to do so, they must remember that he does not forget what he has seen them do. So let's read the scripture. It reads, Whenever I would restore the fortunes of my people, whenever I would heal Israel, the sins of Ephraim are exposed and the crimes of Samaria revealed. They practice deceit. Thieves break into houses, bandits rob in the streets, but they do not realize that I remember all their evil deeds. Their sins engulf them. They are always before me. So you can see why we've put that last portion of verse 11 there. So we learn more, this portion of scripture, we learn more here about the wicked activities of the Israelite people in the north. It says here that there's deceit, there's theft, there's basically break and enter, and there's street robberies. So it doesn't sound like a very fun time to live. We feel we have problems today. Imagine living with this. So it's basically a violent and a dangerous place to be living. Now the sin that was born in Ephraim when the United Kingdom of Israel separated the two has basically led to crime throughout Samaria. The people, the priests and the royal family willfully chose to forget, and this is the key here, they willfully chose to forget the wickedness, but God does not. It's so bad, God says the sins engulf them. Okay, so note here that I've said that they willfully choose to forget their wickedness. If you've done something in the past, do you willfully choose to remember it all the time? Or would you rather forget it? So say I was going to church today and I had done much to turn my life around. Right? When you go into church, if you know someone there who knew you before you turned your life around and they had a secondary conversation in the form of gossip with somebody else, what would they say? They would inevitably say, oh, I used to know that guy. You know what he used to do? And then they'd say, oh, but he turned his life around or I hope he has. So in other words, they're going to condemn that person in their conversation, even though this person's already done the work to change his life. In other words, he's repented, he's changed, he's turned his path away, he's come to the Lord and so on. But man's mouth willfully puts him down still. But if you were that man that that other person is speaking ill of, and someone meets them today, do you think they're going to go, oh, stop, 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 stop. let me tell you about my horrible past and how, what a bad person I am? No. They wouldn't do it, would they? No. Why? Because they've accepted Jesus into their life, they've moved on, it's part of their past, it's not part of their present or their future, and so who's going to choose to willfully dwell on it? No. Only a but it's Only a gossiper. Right. And so when things bad happen in your life or you've done something bad in your life, your willful choice is not to remain there but to change. That was your will, right? Yeah. You changed it. Right. So you're not going to willfully choose to bring up the evil from the past. Yeah. And so it is for these guys. Whatever they've done in the past, it's like they've got one of those magic whiteboards you used to buy where you slide the thing there and all the, all the text is wiped clean all of a sudden and you start again. Right? So even though they're not necessarily walking with God today, they're still in their mind wiping the slate clean of what they did yesterday in order to come before people today. So if you want to have respectability and people to acknowledge you and your position and your role and your power and whatever else, then that has to come by what they perceive of you today. So in other words, if you started in a job as a janitor and you rose through the ranks to become a manager, when people speak to you, do you expect to them do you expect them to address you as a janitor or as a manager? I'm a manager today. Yes, I used to be a janitor, but you don't address me, I no longer do that role. This is now my role, so I deserve respect for my role today. And so we see these people, even in their wrongdoing and wickedness, they willfully choose to forget their past. But, as it says here, God does not. So even for us today, whatever we may sweep under the carpet, 
God has a, an account of it, right? It doesn't mean he doesn't want you to change, doesn't mean that he's not going to forgive you, but he has an account of it. It doesn't just go away. So sin can and often is kept as a secret before mankind. People don't openly walk out and say, oh, you don't want to know me, I'm a really bad person because I'm going to do this to you when I get to know you. Do they? <coughs> they present themselves as a good person. So while people deliberately choose to forget what they have done, secrets are a problem. But God sees everything and remembers everything. This is why the Lord says in verse 2 here, they are always before me. Chapter 7, verse 2. They are always before me. He sees all. So anyone who is a believer today should ask themselves, have I forgotten? If you've changed yourself, that's absolutely wonderful, isn't it? But does it mean that you do, do you forget what you've done in the past? No. no. In fact, sometimes it's knowing the difference between the two that actually keeps you on track today, right? So have I forgotten? And the next question you should ask yourself is, do I think God doesn't see? You'd be very foolish to think that, wouldn't you? Another question, is God blind to my, this, we can be specific here, adultery or premarital sex? And our society may not know, but does God know? Of course. Do I think watching pornography goes unnoticed? Well, it can to other people, but not before God. Do I think God's eyes are closed when I take drugs or drink so much I lose control and get drunk? There's more visible signs for people around you with that, but God sees and remembers. So what I'm getting at here, and there's, and obviously everything can be different for different people in their life and in their circumstances, and this is not about condemning people, but it's about saying things which we don't really want to talk about because this is the whole point of what Jose is saying, right? But they're things that are in people's lives. So there are many people who attend churches all around the world today who think God forgets or never sees the things they do. Am I wrong? See, this is the challenging thing. When we go to church or when we come together, it doesn't mean that people are without sin. People can attend church and make a profession of godliness and pretend that these things are not a part of their lives. It doesn't come up in their conversation on Sunday. It doesn't come up in the relationships with those people they have on Sunday and so on. So if that is you today, you need to do much more than say sorry, and this is the whole point. You need to repent on the understanding that to repent means to change your ways and never go back. So true repentance means there is not a re reoccurrence. And so whatever the thing is in your life, you have to repent and never go back. Now we can take this Old Testament story from Hosea, talking with the Lord, praying with the people, instructing them on how they need to change. But we can apply this to our own lives because nothing has really changed. Right? And so in this situation, Hosea is calling the people of Israel simply to repent and to come back to the Lord. And the Lord's asking them to come back too, again and again and again. He is a merciful God. But it requires them to do something. And if they're unwilling to do something, then they're not going to come back to the Lord. So you might often wish that the passing of time will cause God to forget your sin. But it doesn't. And so this is one of the hard things. Often when people break down in the future and they give their life to the Lord, when the communication with such a person happens, oftentimes the things they talk about are from the past, like a long way in their past. Things that happened when they were kids, things that happened when they got married, things that happened to them when they went to school. And they'll break down 
because they've never addressed it. Mm. And so what they did was they put it aside, pretended it didn't happen, they did all those things, but the reality is in here, right. it's still there. Mm. And the only way to is to Talk. repent, which means that you have to not just say sorry, but you have to do something about it. You have to change. You have to forgive the person that gave that did something to you. Mm. Right? You have to go back to the person and ask them for forgiveness for what you did That's to them. Right. You have to do all the hard yards to change your path. Mm. And so Hosea is calling God's people here to do it, and this message should call anybody who's listening to do the same today. There is only one way. Now there's a precious promise in Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 34 given to those who come to know God under the new covenant. This is Old Testament, remember? This is a prophetic, right? So we're talking about the prophet Jeremiah. It says, For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. How can you have your sins no longer remembered? We're talking about the Lord. We're talking about God, the Father. How? Because he's established here in his word, right, that he sees all things. He knows all things. Right? He has knowledge of everything that you do. And this scripture that we've just been reading says that he remembers all the evil deeds. Mm. They are always before him. So when Jeremiah says this, he will remember their sins no more. It almost seems contrary to what Hosea, the other prophet, has just said. But what is the way that this can be? Salvation, which comes from Jesus. Jesus. Mm. Right. So the only way to do this is by atoning for your sins. Now God says here with Hosea, I don't want your sacrifices, I want your heart. So he's not asking them to do the public thing. Mm. He's asking them to atone for their sins in here. The only way for doing this is by atoning the substitute of Jesus who was crucified in a place under the new covenant. And this not only makes God forget our sin, but makes them as though they never occurred in the first place. And so we have a blessing that wasn't available in the time of Hosea. Mm. But for us today, and the prophets talk about it and they point to it in the future, they say a time will come and the Lord will come and he will atone for your sins for you because you're capable of doing it yourself. So what we have to do, we have to accept Jesus as our Lord and Saviour and we have to repent of our sins in sincerity and then it's as if they're not remembered anymore by the Father. Okay. So let's now move to the next portion of Hosea chapter 7 verses 3 to 7 to learn about the analogy of the oven and what happens to the four kings who rule during Hosea's call to be a prophet. So Hosea chapter 7 verses 3 to 7. So it reads, They delight the king with their wickedness, the princes with their lies. They are all adulterers, burning like an oven, whose fire the baker need not stir from the needy of the dough till it rises. On the day of the festival of our king, the prince has become inflamed with wine, and he joins hands with the mockers. Their hearts are like an oven, they approach him with intrigue. Their passion smoulders all night, in the morning it blazes like a flaming fire. All of them are hot as an oven, they devour their rulers, all their kings fall, and none of them, none of them, calls on me. So this is the Lord speaking. So this portion of scripture begins with the people of Israel being described as what? 
as adulterers, people who worship idols, who delight the king with their wickedness and the princes with their lies. So Israel has become, this is the description, the analogy here, Israel has become like an oven, like an incubator for those who are inflamed with a desire and passion for idols and a desire to rule themselves. The princes, the scripture here says, are fueled with wine and they are accompanied by mockers of the king who present them with intrigue. The princes are like buns in the oven with yeast added. The mockers are like bakers who words of intrigue are tr of, or treason so intrigue is another word for treason, smoulders like passion all night until they fester and become so unstable, which is the word hot in the scripture, that they are blazing like a flaming fire, as it says in the scripture, in the morning, and they do what? They assassinate the king. So can you imagine? We're all together. We're all having a big party. right? The wine is flowing. And the people, the mockers, are there in the ears of the other princes, the ones who have the power to do something about it, the other leaders, and saying, you know, we should bump off the king, he's a bad person, he's this, this, this. And so they drink, 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 and they get emboldened through the night, and then it festers, you know, they're thinking and they're chewing on it, and it gets to the morning, it's like a raging fire, and what they do, they go and assassinate the king. Mm. Right? So this is what happens when we come under the influence of people and of alcohol, self-belief mm. right? we take on a persona that is not ours we think we are powerful and the end result is destruction they're going to kill the mm. king so this is reflected in verse 7 when God says all their kings fall and none of them calls on me so in other words none of them are worshipping the Lord God didn't protect them he let them fall they are all Adulterers, they are all idol worshippers. So Israel has become a cesspit of wickedness that one king after another is assassinated. And whilst they make a public show of sacrificing at the temple, none of them prayed to God or knew him in any way at all, and none of them are worthy to be king. Now during the rule of sorry, during the ministry, when Hosea was called to be a prophet for God, there was four kings that changed hands. So three kings were assassinated, the original king when his ministry was first called, and then there was an assassination, another assassination, another assassination, and then there was a fourth king. So there was a rapid succession of assassinations. Some of them were six months, some of them were three months. And so this is what the scripture is speaking into, the fact that these kings were being bumped off, people were fueled with alcohol, worship of false idols, self-power, and there was people, mockers, who were talking about the kings and mocking them, and the others felt empowered that they could take the kingdom from them. And so the result of idol worship, drunkenness, and gossip is death. And so this is what Jose describes. So my question is that understanding the word Ephraim, oh sorry, I'm jumping the gun here, so none of them, and it's the problem that those who killed one another, none of them, because they're idol worshippers, are worthy to be king themselves. They're all the same as each other. So, so before that question, I've got to put up the next scripture, which is Hosea 7 through to verses 8 to 10. And it talks about the pride and stubbornness of Israel in this portion. So Hosea 7 verses 8 to 10. And it reads, Ephraim mixes with the nations. Ephraim is a flat cake, not turned over. Foreigners sap his strength, but he does not realise it. His hair is sprinkled with grey, but he does not notice. Israel's arrogance testifies against him, but despite all this, he does not return to the Lord his God or search for him. So understanding the word Ephraim, the question I was going to ask, is used synonymously with Israel. What do you think God means when he describes them like a flat cake that's not turned over? So what we find in the Bible all the time, 
is that descriptions are used that people there who lived at the time would understand what they mean, right? So he said, the scripture says, Ephraim is a flat cake not turned over. It's, it's very good, but, it, but it's full short of the full description. Outward appearance. Outward appearance. Well, we're talking about something very specific. It says a flat cake not turned over. Firstly, what is a flat cake? What do they call a flat cake in these times? Unleavened bread. Right, it's a cake of bread. Bread. Right, so it's actually bread. Okay, so when they cooked bread in these times, they had very simple means. And so when <coughs> they would cook it, often it would be cooked on both sides by turning it over like a pancake. So put on one side, so I've done the same. I've taken dough. We can form a, a, a roti, for example, for India, uh, and we can put it in a hot pan or on a hot plate. We can cook it until it starts to blister, flip it over, cook it on the other side, and then we use it to eat, right? So it receives cooking on both sides. We don't want raw dough on one side and cooked on the other side. And so when he says this, he's talking about that it's been turned over and cooked on both sides. So he's saying Ephraim is a flat cake not turned over. In other words, it's cooked on one side, but it's not cooked on the other. What do the two sides represent? Good and bad. Well, inevitably they do. <laughs> what do you think they represent in context of what's going on? God think about what's going on. Sorry? It's like God and man. It's like... What? Right. So we've got God. So we'll take that. Well, God on one side. What's on the other side? Baal. The, the gods. Yeah. Right. Yeah. False gods. False gods. Right. So he's saying that Ephraim is a flat cake that's not turned over. In other words, they represent only one side being worshipped, but not the other. So Israel is like this half-baked cake. Burned on one side by, because with the analogy of the oven, burned on one side by idols mm. and uncooked on the other side by God. Israel thinks, because it's got two sides, even though one's not cooked and one is, it means that one exists, but one's cooked. In other words, one's used more or prepared more or, or part of life, whereas the other one's not. Right? To make a dough means it exists in the first place. Cooking one side and not the other side is a difference between the two sides. So what it's actually saying is that Israel thinks it can serve both the Lord and the idols at the same time. And it's what I've described and talked about in the past. It's called henotheism. It's when we worship God and idols at the same time. But God obviously says he will not accept any other God before him. So it's not acceptable to God. So in other words, they're going to the temple, as the scriptures have described. They're taking their sacrifice. So there's an outward appearance that it's bread, right? It's dough. But it's not cooked. So they're not practicing anything in terms of their relationship with God himself. So verse 9 here says, Foreigners sap his strength, but he does not realize it. This makes the tragic ruin of Israel even worse, for it is being ravaged by foreigners who represent sin and they do not know it. They should, of course, know it, but mankind has an amazing ability to deceive themselves when they are in sin. Even though a person can deceive themselves, it can often be apparent to everyone else and Israel's situation is not unusual. So in this portion of scripture it says, the cake is not turned over, so it is burned and ruined and they do not know it. The second one says their strength is devoured, but they do not know it. So we're talking about what's happening to Israel. Okay? So they're serving foreign gods and they're burned because of it, but they don't know it. That was the first portion. Their strength is devoured, they don't know it. It says their hair is sprinkled with grey. So what do you think they say that for? What, is, what does hair sprinkled with grey represent? It's old, finished. Getting older, mm. right? Wisdom it should. <laughs> wisdom it should. But we have said before, sometimes wisdom does not come with age either. No. Right? But the thing is, it represents a nation that is ageing and weakening and they do not know it. Mm. And the fourth one is Israel's arrogance or pride testifies against it. 
and they do not know it. So in other words, Israel is on the decline, but they're unwilling to recognize it. They're worshipping idols, right? They're assassinating their leaders. Mm. They're deceiving each other. They're murdering one another. They're robbing one another. All this stuff is happening, but they seem to think it's normal. That's okay. Because they forget. They want to put it behind them and just live the day. Okay, so let's now see what Hosea has to say in verses 11 to 12. And this is to see how Israel is silly like a dove. Why do you think a dove is used to represent Israel being silly, do you think? You ever watched a dove fly or walk? Yeah. It flutters its wings, it rapidly changes direction, its head bobs like this, (laughs) right? So, all over the place. so I won't do an impersonation. <laughs> but, but, but the fact is, is that they pick on this book, the dove. So it reads Ephraim, sorry, say, say again, verses 11 to 12 of chapter 7. Ephraim is like a dove, easily deceived and senseless. Now calling to Egypt, now turning to Assyria. When they go, I will throw my net over them. I will pull them down like the birds in the sky. When I hear them flocking together, I will catch them. Mm. So all the analogies about the bird, right? So like a dove, Israel basically flies about to other nations. So it mentions Egypt, it mentions Assyria. So these they go to to, uh, ask for help. So Hosea piles image upon image as Israel flutters about like a confused and lost bird without direction. Who should they be flying to? God, but they don't. They go to fly to countries who are actually those who will come against them. That's how stupid they are. And that's why this scripture says here, easily deceived and senseless. Mm. They're flying to their own enemy. They call to Egypt and turn to Assyria. They think they can escape God by running to other nations. So in life, when we're having a problem and we need to face God about something, sometimes we run to other things to solve the problem or to another person to talk about it, right? Sometimes you need to pray to the Father. But the Lord says, I will pull them down like the birds in the sky. And when he hears them flocking together, he says he will catch them. Okay, so Israel's guilt is actually increased by flocking together. If you go to associate with your enemies and the enemies of God, Mm. what's going to happen? You become like them, you you, you form an alliance, so in other words, you act in them as one body, right? And these people are not godly people. And so God basically says, that they're going to have a greater knowledge and a greater accountability before him because they've made a choice to go to their enemies. Mm. So Jesus has something to say in Luke 12, verse 48, which I'll put up here. He says, From everyone who has been given much, much will be demanded. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So, what was given to the Israelites? The land of milk and honey. Right. Life. The covenant said that he, God said that he would give them this land. Mm. Right? When Solomon did the wrong thing and the land was split into two, God didn't say, hey, Jeroboam, I want you to walk away from me now. He expected that they would continue on as godly people. But mm. straight away they walked away from him. So... Basically, it's saying here, from everyone who's been given much, much will be demanded. So God expects them to be loyal to him. Mm. And from the one who has been entrusted with much, much more will be asked. So in other words, if I'm serving the Lord, then the Lord should be asking me, and I should be doing his bidding. Mm. Right? So this brings us, and there's also a quantity, just notice there's a quantity thing. If I go to my enemies... Right? I now become part of a bigger body, right? So there's much more that's going to be demanded of me in that situation than if I'm just accountable for my own nation, mm. right? So if you become part of a group or an organisation, right, and you become part of that body, then you now have something else that's an increase in your life that you right. are now responsible for 
other than just yourself, correct? And so by so doing, that means that you may be part of an organization that then says, I want you to help us. I want you to do something. Mm. And so in other words, you're going to be asked. And then if you're a part of that and your, your, your uh, heart is there and your help is there, then of course you'll sow into it and you will help and be a participant. So this brings us to our last scripture portion for today. And it's from Hosea 7 again. Verses 13 to 16, so the last portion, verses 13 to 16, which says that by Israel running to the nations, and this is the truth of the matter, it has run away from God. So in other words, you're either heading towards or you're going the other way. So let's read it. It says, Woe to them because they have strayed from me. So this is God speaking, of course. Destruction to them. So in other words, here it comes. Because they have rebelled against me. And yet he says, I long to redeem them, but they speak about me falsely. They do not cry out to me from their hearts. Remember, he says he doesn't want their sacrifice. He wants their hearts. But wail on their beds. Self-pity. They slash themselves. You know what that means? These ancient priests, they used to cut their arms. And they were bleeding. Can you imagine doing that to yourself? They slash themselves, appealing to their gods for grain and new wine, but they turn away from me. So when they're talking about grain and wine, that's because God has put a famine on the land. Okay, So instead of turning to him and repenting and he'll put everything back as it should be, mm. they're now slashing their wrists to false idols because they're going without. And then it says, but they turn away from me. I trained them and strengthened their arms, but they plot evil against me. They do not turn to the most high. They are like a faulty bow. Their leaders will fall by their sword because of their insolent words. So they're assassinated, which the scriptures tell us. For this, they will be ridiculed in the land of Egypt. Okay. So Israel has worshipped foreign idols, run to foreign nations for help, but failed to worship God and come to God. God has judged Israel and they are unrepentant. This tells you here. Right? They don't come to God. They don't change their ways. They get to start slashing their wrists and all this. So the time for their destruction awaits them. Israel can see their problem, but can't seem to see the sin that causes it. So in other words, the fact that they're doing this means that they have a problem and they acknowledge that. But instead of seeing that they need to repent to God, as Hosea is here telling them to do, they go to other nations instead. So God's hand is now about to come against them, but again, they still don't turn back to him, but rather, what do they do? They wail on their beds. They're lying in bed crying. Right? So their treachery is complete. They appeal to false gods for provision and stupidly believe by slashing their arms with knives, they can petition for the provision of grain and wine as if an act of self-mutilation will somehow cause these false gods to provide them with their needs. We sort of laugh about this, but it's a common thing for young people today to cut themselves. Yeah. Right? So you want to be honest? It, uh, there's some aspects here that haven't changed. Yeah. And so if they're cutting themselves, it tells you that they're not walking with the Lord. They're not appealing to God for help, are they? Yeah. Right? They're doing something physical to themselves. Um, self-harm. Right? In the belief that it will somehow change their lives and of course it doesn't no Hmm? so all levels of society oh sorry so Jose adds another piece of imagery when he says in verse 16 that the Israelites are like a faulty bow that won't shoot straight everything that comes from Israel misses the mark because they are treacherous like a useless and yet dangerous weapon so in conclusion today We have to acknowledge that our Lord God is all-seeing, He is all-powerful, and He is all-knowing. Hosea gives the word of the Lord to His people in Israel, and after passing God's judgment upon them, they still remain unrepentant and unwilling to turn to the Lord. During the course of this time, the people of Israel make their sacrifices to God, but do not give Him their heart. All levels of society are wicked. The common people, the priesthood, and the kings who rule over them. Israel is besieged with crime and bloodshed, 
and their own rulers are assassinated in rapid succession. God is unwilling to let them continue in this way, so he tells them a time is coming when their leaders will fall by the sword because of their insolent words. We can see how, when mankind is left to their own devices, and I've often said this, they walk themselves into their own problems and their own destruction. They become wicked and violent, and suffering becomes the norm. It's, it's, (laughs) It's such pertinent scripture with how things are today. It's like that, then. People don't always want to know God. They don't want to see God as their resolution, as their place to solve their problem. And so they go about solving things their own way. And God sends punishment on people, and yet people, instead of turning to him, they don't. Mm. They go out in their own strength, and they determine that they're going to solve the problem by themselves. And so this is something for each of us to dwell upon, I think especially with what's happening. And I know there's going to be more things in our futures and there's been things in our past, but this is one. This is a big one at the moment. Mm. Right? Because we're living in a time where people are talking about one another in a bad way. Society has been divided. Man is trying to solve its own problems and on it goes. And so what do we really need to do? I mean, the world would bow on its knees and pray to God we would have our problems solved. But whilst we're divided, the enemy wins. And this is the case. And this is the lesson that the Lord teaches us. So for us, we should be saying to ourselves, let us always come to you. Let us repent of our sins, and we also should be repenting for what? For the sins of our nation, for the sins of our leaders, for the sins of our friends and our family. So in other words, we accept responsibility as part of the human race for the sins of others. Just Mm. as many examples are in the Bible, Nehemiah is a great one. Mm. And as a consequence of that, let us be restored into relationship with the Lord to live a life that is blessed by the Lord. And that should be what we are seeking. And so this message today talks about what happens when people are unrepentant and even in the face of understanding that God is angry with them, they continue to serve idols and they continue to go to others for their, to resolve their problems. And so if there's things in our lives and in the world around us that is beyond our capacity, we have to acknowledge that that is the case and we need to give it to the Lord, as we mm. say. We need to pray to him and we need to ask for his help and we need to ask for his forgiveness and we need to stay the course, meaning that we repent and we change the path that we walk on. Okay, let's just bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this today. We thank you for your word from Jose. We see so much pertinence in what happened back then, Lord, but there are many things in this which is still the case for us today. Lord, we stand before you and we acknowledge that as human beings we have a sin nature, Lord, and that is part of our identity. But in Christ, we can change all things. So Lord, we dedicate ourselves and we refresh ourselves today with your word. We take the knowledge that you give to us to have wisdom so that when things come against us, Lord, that instead of turning to solutions which are not from you, Lord, that we turn to you first and we ask for your help, we ask for your protection, we ask for your provision. Lord, we ask you for knowledge and wisdom. We ask you for patience. We ask you to continue to love one another despite what people are saying, what people are doing. We ask that we continue to love the politicians. We ask we, that we continue to love those people who may have a different opinion to us, Lord. We ask for forgiveness for those who are doing things which may harm us, our families, and people that we love, Lord. Lord, we get on our knees before you today. We, we beseech you that in these difficult times that we're experiencing, and the COVID word just keeps coming up again and again, mm. 
but also as a concern is the new communication about marks of the beast and one world order. Lord, all of this is of the devil. Lord, so we give all of this to you. We trust in you and you only. Lord, we obey you and you only. And Lord, we ask you for your direction. We ask you to bless us with knowledge and discernment. And we ask you to uh, bless us with the wisdom from your word to go out from here refreshed today and into a new week, Lord, where we are reinvigorated, that we feel strong, Lord, and we feel obedient to your will, and that we seek you and no other for our solutions. So, Lord, we thank you today. We ask you to bless this teaching. We ask you to bless everybody that's receiving this. Lord, I ask your blessings upon everybody as they go out today. May your face always shine upon them. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.